All right, I just want to say welcome to everybody. So nice of you all to join us here today for Women's League Reads, um, part of Women's League. And we have had a few book authors um, over the years. Mostly we've had uh, fiction and nonfiction book um, uh, authors of one single book. But today, um, through the brilliant idea of my co-conspirator, uh, Susan, that we have um, came up with a, a panel of poets. And um, so we hope this will be a very um, exciting day today. Um, for poets, we'll give them each a few minutes to read, share some of their poetry and, and have a conversation with Susan about their poetry. Um, and then at the end, we'll open the chat. Right now, the chat will be closed. Um, but at the end, we will open the chat for questions from our audience that we'll be able to present to the uh, four poets at the end. Um, so I will introduce uh, Susan and um, start the program of uh, poetry with Women's League Reads. Before we jump to me, Debbie, did you want to say share some words? I would. Um, thank you, Merle and Susan, for the opportunity to, um, to greet everyone. And I wanna welcome you to Women's League Reads, which many of you know is one of the crown jewels of Women's League and one of the things that we do best. Um, I wanna thank Merle and Susan for the wonderful work they do to provide us with this opportunity. And um, Ellen Bresnick and Julia Loeb who are both on, who are the education um, co-chairs. And, um, you know, just, Thank you so much to everyone who's participating. And as I just told the authors a few minutes ago, there may only be a small uh, group of us on today, but we'll put it on the Women's League website and hundreds will watch it later. I know that there are many events happening today in other communities around North America, and they may not have been able to get on, um, but they will be able to see this later. So thank you again for all you do, Merle and Susan, and we're looking forward to hearing from the wonderful authors today. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, we're going to start with Alicia, excuse me, with Erica Dreyfus. Erica lives in New York City. She graduated Harvard University and she also lectured there. She has two volumes of note. One is called Birthright, a collection of poems, and one is called Quiet Americans, probably a collection of stories. And she was the recipient of the Sophie Brody Medal of Honor. And she presently lectures at Baruch College of City University of New York, for those people who were from the greater New York area, which is where I started, but I now live in Cincinnati. And her online learning to write tool is called the Practicing Writer. So Erica, why don't you start us off with some poems? this oh. afternoon. Okay, thank you so much. It is really such an honor to have been invited to participate today. So I am very grateful to Women's League Reads for the invitation. And I'm really quite dazzled to be in the company of my co-presenters. I have admired all of their work for so long. And I almost can't believe that I'm on this virtual stage alongside them. So it's really, it's really something. Um, as mentioned, my book of poems is titled Birthright, and it's a collection of 54 poems that in various ways reflect on issues of inheritance and legacy. And it's therefore quite identity driven, and since dominant parts of my identity include Jewishness and womanhood, those are themes that recur throughout the book. Some of the poems are autobiographical and confessional vignettes. Others take what is often called a midrashic approach, revisiting sacred or biblical texts, often filling in gaps in the official plot or giving voice to marginalized characters, or um, sometimes reframing the traditional liturgy for, my, for and from, I guess, my own 21st century perspective. Some of the poems engage with historical or recent news events, and still others fuse family history with those events. So my aim today is to try to provide a kind of representative sampling of what's in the book. And I'll start with what is the book's opening poem. And um, 
as the poem itself will reveal, um, my father's parents were German Jews, but I did not inherit from them the innate ability to speak German, so I apologize in advance for the mangling of pronunciation, but I, I do the best I can. And this poem is titled Punklichkeit. My father's parents were Germans, and they were Jews, and they were born long ago, one just before and one just after the outbreak of the war that was to end all wars, but didn't. They came to New York in 37 and 38, met and married and had a son. From them, I have inherited copies of Der Struvelpeter and Budenbrooks, a fondness for Riesling and Punklichkeit. Punklichkeit is beyond punctuality. It is showing up ahead of time for movies, meetings, and medical appointments, submitting assignments safely before deadline, and returning library books at least one day before they're due. Punklichkeit is a preemptive way of life, and not everyone admires it. Even Rabbi Breuer of Frankfurt, later of Washington Heights, scolded guests who rang his doorbell before the agreed upon time. Zufru ist auch nicht punklich. But this ethos served my grandparents well. They left Germany before the Kristallnacht, before the MS St. Louis, before their neighbors were called to trains that went first to France and then to Auschwitz. Who knows how many reported to the railways before the hour they were told. Um, I'm going to move now into one of my rewritings of the, or reinscriptions of something traditional. And um, this one is uh, called Kaddish for my uterus. Exalted and hallowed be surgery's great name in the world where none of my gynecologists earlier ideas, not the differently dosed birth control pills, nor a specific intrauterine device, nor a DNC, put an end to the mischief of those four fibroids, to a daily life constrained by the mess, the pain, the sheer weariness of endless blood and clots. May surgery's majesty be proclaimed all the remaining days of my lifetime, joyfully, energetically, to which I say, Amen. Blessed be surgery's great name. Equally blessed, praised, honored, and exalted be my gynecologist's skill with a scalpel once she yielded to my entreaties and accepted that even if I met my soulmate the very next day, I'd long since passed the point of seeking to preserve my fertility, such as it may yet have been, my having already crossed the Rubicon into my fifth decade without any concerted effort to make use of it. May there be abundant gratitude too that I opted for the old school, traditional approach, not for me the ultra-modern robotics or the tumor-shredding power morselator used in a less invasive laparoscopic procedure, which, while well-intended, could also send any hidden malignancy shooting through to stake a fatal claim elsewhere in the body. May the freedom from those four freakingly frustrating fibroids the immeasurable improvement in my quality of life after surgery bring peace to me, my loved ones, and everyone else with whom I interact, to which I say, Amen. And this next one um, is actually one that I wrote a long time before um, our current situation, but I've been reading frequently at events this last year, um, in part because it includes the concept of quarantine, and indeed the title of the poem itself is Miriam Quarantined, and the poem begins with a brief epigraph from the Book of Numbers, chapter 12. So Miriam was shut out of camp seven days, and the people did not march on until Miriam was readmitted. Had another been stricken on the way to the promised land, had the divine perhaps punished my brother Aaron, who, may the record show, was equally at fault, I'd have cared for the patient, no matter how feverish or contagious or leprous. 
but when I was the one afflicted and the divine refused my other brother's plea for mercy, none sat by my side or brought me water or smoothed my brow. Cast out to suffer seven days in solitude, I knew not what would greet me once the snow white scales had faded, the skin refreshed, the illness and banishment ended. How miraculous the discovery, the people had remained. How indescribable the emotions as we set out anew together. A number of the poems um, in the book also reflect on um, engagement with Israel because my Zionism is also a big part of my identity. And this poem um, was written during one of the um, situations with conflict with Gaza. And sadly, it turns out to be an evergreen poem that I've been sharing many times since I first wrote it. The title is Questions for the Critics. Would you be satisfied then if more Israelis died? If children and their parents didn't heed the sirens? If they didn't burrow beneath the ground? If the rockets were better in design and aim? If they landed on Ben Yehuda and Dizengoff? In your calculus, would the Israelis be justified then? Would it all be more proportionate? Oh, that word if only those hundreds of rockets flying toward them left fewer able to run, to hide, and to fight back. And um, I'll conclude with a poem that's actually a prose poem. It's called Diaspora. And I'm just wondering if there happens to be anybody on this call um, who belongs to Congregation to Ferrith Israel in Columbus, Ohio, because this one's especially for you. Rain delays my flight an hour, another. Other flights are canceled, diverted. I wait for my plane to Columbus, Ohio, where the elder daughter of a second cousin will be called to the Torah as a bat mitzvah in the morning. I wait, despite the storms and the announcements and the overcrowded Delta terminal in New York and the additional holdup after boarding as thunder rattles the commuter jet on the tarmac. And in the end, I will arrive safely at the Columbus Airport Marriott at 2.30 a.m. Seven hours later, in the sanctuary of Congregation to Ferrith Israel on East Broad Street, young Talia stands behind the Torah. Her maternal grandmother, my father's first cousin, recites a Hebrew prayer in the cadence of the Sabra she is. The paternal grandparents chant together with the Lusophone inflections of their family's adopted home in Sao Paulo, and the entire Brazilian contingent laughs when the rabbi attempts a few words in Portuguese. And the rest of us, the aunts and uncles and cousins of varying degrees, have converged from Canada and California, from Memphis and Boston, from Raleigh and tiny Williamson, West Virginia, and in our blood, and our bones, we've reconstructed here the remnants of our common home, the birthplace of my father's parents and the Sabras, Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. The mid-October sun streams through stained glass into the sanctuary, colors beaming. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, I think you and I have a little bit more in common, but I'm not sure it's unique just to the two of us. Um, I, uh, my parents uh, settled in New York with me. Uh, my dad was from Germany. My mom was from Poland, but mastered German. And I had the opportunity to live 10 years in Germany as a Department of Defense school teacher. So um, some of the, the details you shared in Punktlichkeit um, <laughs> resonated deeply for me, <laughs> in part because it was ingrained, <laughs> as well as my seeing it manifested in when the years I lived in Germany. 
Yes, um, every time every time people talk about Jewish time and that it's late, I think that's not all Jewish time. So. No, it, no, it's not necessarily <laughs> just Jewish. Um, I just feel that there is um, a number of ideas you've brought up for us to discuss um, or elaborate upon. Um, and, and I believe the fact that you talked about at the very beginning that you're inspired by your inheritance, your legacy, and you are looking at the text, especially when you shared Miriam quarantine and her exclusion from the Israelite camp due to her leprosy and the emotional uh, impact it has on people being excluded or being quarantined that a lot of us are more cognizant of today with the now year long quarantining and isolation some of us have had to deal with because of the coronavirus, uh, the modern plague, so to speak. Um, so I really appreciate your choice of these five poems. Um, and yet we're, we're also still contending with in the news today, if we pay attention to Israel, these are ongoing questions we have for the critics, you know, uh, how we can live with ourselves as Jews and yet, and human beings in terms of that, that ongoing dilemma. Um, you know, I just think that there's, and then you have a very personal poem regarding your physical well-being and decisions you were forced to make that, um, and, and the details you brought up in the poem, Kaddish from my uterus, it gives me the understanding of how much you investigated your options. Um, and you had uh, medical advice that was very detailed and very, um, encouraging you to make a prudent decision that you could live with. Because my perception is not every doctor is willing to guide us to make those kinds of decisions. You know, so I commend you for having that kind of physician to turn to and making that, all that investigation, because not everyone is willing or capable of doing that or insists on it. So, um, Merle, did you have any comments before we move on to our next poet? Uh, no, I, I think we can, we look forward to the next one. Thank you very much, Erica. It okay. Beautiful. Yes, it was very moving. Our next poet comes from Blacksburg, Virginia, Erica Meitner. Erica grew up in the New York area and also I believe has the German or European background related to Holocaust survival. Um, she has six published poetry collections. I'll list them later when in my document about our event. And she is the recipient of the 2018 National Jewish Book Award for Poetry. And she's living in Blacksburg, Virginia of all places because she's on faculty at Virginia Tech, where she directs the writing program for the graduate students as well as the undergraduates there. So Erica, I welcome you to share some of your poems. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'm really glad to be here with Women's League Reads and with other Erica and with our two Alicias. Um, I was cracking up because we have these like weird name synchronicities. Um, and so I'm excited to be reading with you all because of your poems, but also because I've never done a double Erica reading ever. Um, and the fact that we have two Alicias too is kind of great. I'm actually, so, so my book that won the National Jewish Book Award and it's backwards for you as I hold it up is called Holy Moly Carry Me. And it's a book about um, a lot of different things. My family history, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, but it's also a book about raising one white son and one black son um, as a Jewish mother 
in 21st century Appalachia, which is where I live. I live in rural Southwest Virginia. I'm 30 miles from the West Virginia border. Um, and uh, we have a lay-led Jewish community here. I do baby namings and weddings sometimes. Um, so it's a really different kind of place than the Queens and Long Island communities where I grew up in, where the bagel places and pizza places would close on Pesach. Um, so this first poem is actually called Diaspora too. Um, Erica ended with diaspora, I'm gonna open with diaspora. And one of the things I write about a lot is exile and kind of galut of living down here. And this poem is about the sheer horror of bringing my son back to New York City and realizing that he's not gonna be a New Yorker. Like there's this very specific feeling about this. Um, and I took him on the subway, this was years ago already. Um, anyway, I'm just gonna read this a little bit um, to open because I think it's, a, it's an interesting kind of exile to be a Jewish New Yorker outside of New York. Diaspora. I am riding the F train to Brooklyn with my son who is Appalachian as much as anything, who is six and does not notice the Hasidic women reading to Helim on their way home, praying Psalms from worn leather bound cedarim, moving their lips past Broadway, Second Avenue, Delancey. And he would not know to identify them by their below the knee skirts, the filled in parts of their shadows where scalp should be visible or the Brighton beach men in gray fedoras with threatening hand tattoos speaking Russian, the occasional wondrous mosaic murals or regular green and white tiles spelling station names, Bergen Street, Carroll Street, Smith 9th Street, my son discovering he can see his own reflection in the windows of the cars when they plunge into dark tunnels while the women's lips keep moving. And I want to tell him I know their kind, though I know to say this is reductive or offensive, even if I might say it too about the bleach blonde with the septum ring or the old Russian mobsters. So when he says, it's hard to believe that you got off here every day, I agree. And think of all the times I climbed the station stairs or felt the give of metal turnstiles on my hips, the jangle of apartment keys, or click of my own heels on pavement after a night out too late, the car service guys playing dominoes on overturned crates outside the bodega who didn't look up, and the way the trains still vibrate beneath the surface with exactly the same frequency they always did, blowing hot air through the grates, rattling me to the bone with foreboding joy. And I want to tell him, I know this exact moment, the one where you finally learn the contours of your own face, its beauty as it hurtles through darkness. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about my family history because I wanna read a couple of family poems. Um, so I think of myself as kind of a throwback Jew because I'm in my mid forties, but I'm first generation American. Um, my mother was born in a DP camp, a displaced persons camp in Stuttgart after my grandparents were liberated from Auschwitz. Um, my maternal grandparents were in um, three different concentration camps each. Um, and my father's family um, immigrated from what was then Czechoslovakia to what was then British Mandate Palestine. So my father was actually born in Haifa in 1947 after my family escaped um, Hitler in Czechoslovakia. So um, they both my parents, my mother's family didn't get visas to come to the US until 1952. She came over on a converted troop ship and my father's family emigrated to America from Israel in when he was 13. So um, I grew up in a Yiddish and German speaking household um, English was both my parents' second languages. I spent my summer up in the Catskills in bungalow colonies. Um, and I grew up in these very insular communities um, where almost everybody had, was um, the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. Like it wasn't weird to be 3G. Everyone's grandparents had accents. Like, um, and, and so it gave me a very distinct um, 
kind of uh, flavor of Judaism. I think one of the things that's fascinating though is like many 3G grandchildren, my grandmother didn't talk about what had happened to her during the war until the, um, until the Fortune Off archives came around trying to interview her, the Shoah Foundation. And it wasn't until I was in college that I found out her whole story. Um, and so this is a tiny poem of, about um, a little bit of her story. 1944, my grandmother made holes in hand grenades to leave Bergen Belsen each dark night shift, burnt out bulbs beneath the canopy of forest, bare shouldered trees like the thinnest trip wires, the name of the unnamed over and over hollow bones scraping the space nothing could reach. What would you place in her outstretched hands? And so my grandmother was actually a nurse midwife in the Sosnowiec ghetto in Poland. So she was one of the last people deported out of the ghetto. Um, and they put her to work eventually in a munitions factory. And she had a very black sense of humor. <laughs> And so I would say to her, Baba, which is what I called her, I'd say, Baba, what did you know about like, you know, working in a munitions factory? And she'd stop sort of deadpan and look at me and she'd say, that's why the Germans won the war. Um, and so she, when she died, um, she, she took Yiddish with her because my mother had no one left to speak Yiddish to. And so this is a poem about um, both my grandmother's unveiling at the cemetery and also the death of Yiddish in my family. Um, and there's some Yiddish in here, but I translated immediately afterwards. So you don't need to know Yiddish to understand this poem. Um, and it takes place in the cemetery in New Jersey where my grandmother is buried. And when she died, it really, we lost our family matriarch and a lot of the oral history that went with that too. Yiddish land. The people who sang to their children in Yiddish and worked in Yiddish and made love in Yiddish are nearly all gone. Phantasmic, Haim, der may on. the month of May has arrived. At the cemetery, my aunt has already draped my grandmother's half of the tombstone with a white sheet. The fabric is tacked to the polished granite by gray and brown rocks lifted from my grandfather's side of the plot. He's been gone over 25 years. We are in Beth Israel Cemetery, Block 50, Woodbridge, New Jersey, for the unveiling and the sky is like lead. We are in my grandmother's shtetl in Poland, but everyone is dead. The fraternal order of Bandin Susnowicz or sick and benevolent society has kept these plots faithfully next to their Holocaust memorial, gray stone archway topped with a menorah and a curse. Pour out thy wrath upon the Nazis and the wicked Germans, for they have destroyed the seed of Jacob. May the Almighty avenge their blood. Great is our sorrow and no consolation is to be found. My sister in her cardboard kippa opens her prayer book, a special edition she borrowed from rabbinical school and begins to read in Aramaic. Not one of us can bring ourselves to add anything to the fixed liturgy. My son is squatting at the next grave over, collecting decorative stones from the Glicksteins double plot. We eat yellow sponge cake and drink small cups of brandy to celebrate my grandmother's life. We are no longer mourners, says Jewish law. Can we tell this story in Yiddish? put the words in the right places. My son cracks a plastic cup until it's shredded to strips, looks like a clear spider, sounds like an error. When my sister finally pulls back the sheet, all the things my grandmother was barely fit on the face of the marker. A year ago at the funeral, her friend Goldie told me she was strong like steel, soft like butter. Women like that, they don't make anymore. My mother tries to show my grandmother, now this gray marker, my son, how he's grown, but he squirms from her arms. Ir gavure eat nitsu bishrebin, her strength was beyond description. The people who sang to their children in Yiddish 
and admonished them in Yiddish are nearly all gone. Whole vanished towns that exist now only in books, their maps drawn entirely by heart. This unknown continent, this language of nowhere, these stones from a land that never was. Der May Kumpschoinan, the month of May has arrived. Der Wind Voyet, the wind howls, says I'm not a stranger anywhere. On the stones we write all we remember, but we are poor guardians of memory. Can you say it in Yiddish? Can you bless us? So I'm gonna end on a, a newish poem um, that's not in any of my books. It actually was um, published pretty recently in Paper Brigade, which is the journal of the um, Jewish Book Council. And it's a protest poem about a time that I went to my local congressman's office in, um, in Virginia and stood outside protesting on behalf of refugees and particularly um, detained children. So um, it, it has a moment in, in this poem um, that talks a little bit about when I went to see my congressman and told him my family story. Um, and one of the things he told me was, um, oh no, you know, like what happened with Nazis could only um, have happened in Germany. It would never happen here. And um, the other thing that appears in this poem, and I don't know if you all are familiar with these from your kids or your grandkids, but there are these puzzles, um, Melissa and Doug puzzles that have pieces on them that when you take off the pieces, they're light sensitive and they make noises. Um, and thank you for being a great audience. I write long poems, so this is the last one I'm gonna read. Light sensitive puzzle piece. And I, one thing I'll say is as a child of a refugee, this is something that's very close to my heart. So light sensitive puzzle piece. At the protest where everyone was outraged about children in cages, a guy who looked vaguely like Jesus was holding a keep families together sign and a woman who wanted to speak was holding a megaphone then said, I've never used one of these things. How does it work? And her friend with the love thy neighbor, no exception sign said, hold it closer to your mouth. And she did. And while she was speaking, Pickups drove by with enormous Trump flags. Pickups drove by blasting aggressive country, God bless the USA. And I couldn't stop looking at protest Jesus's work boots, his cut off homemade tank top. I was holding a sign sharpied on the back of a pizza box from four protests ago that said child of a refugee with a red arrow pointing to me. And I stood near three women with small cages for rabbits, birds, gerbils that each held dolls. One was a cabbage patch kid with blonde braids since protest as mixed media sculpture is a thing now, even in Appalachia. And there was a toddler wearing a Superman shirt holding a rainbow Superman was a refugee poster and his father was holding him on his shoulders. Some nights when it was late and my sons were small and asleep in their beds, I'd turn off all the lights in the house and suddenly the sound of a train or a cow or a cricket, something moving and alive from their puzzles would speak when you shifted a piece off or put one back on. This inanimate thing made animate by light would utter ghost sounds. The reporter from the local paper asked me why I was there on the sidewalk. So I told her about my mother and the DP camps. I told her only a small part of the story, but she still looked shocked. To hold is to bear the weight of a person or thing, to grasp or carry or support with our arms, to embrace someone, to keep or detain someone. There's the hold of a ship, or remaining secure and intact in a position to maintain a connection until the person on the phone line is free to speak, to have in your possession the act of grasping something, a degree of power or control. The last Shoah survivors are nearly gone, so they've made holograms to tell their stories to school children and museum visitors, but it's not the same. 
we respond to the sound of an actual human voice attached to a body, which means when the next woman with a megaphone in an ecumenical collar starts to read the last four lines of Emma Lazarus's The New Colossus, there's not a dry eye on the sidewalk in front of our local congressional office, the congressman who is away, the congressman who got teary when he looked me in the eye and said that kind of persecution could only happen in Germany when I told him my family story, refugee from Fujio to flee or escape from this to that. Our meeting was a season before Nazis marched through Charlottesville and the rabbis pulled the Torah scrolls from the building and someone was killed. And I began quizzing my sons on our full names, addresses, phone numbers. Superman, born Kal El on the planet Krypton, was rocketed to earth by his father unaccompanied, alone as an infant moments before the destruction of his planet. It was months before anger turned to panic, then to fear. And here we are, the dislodged pieces, shoulder to shoulder, light sensitive and bleeding into the deep night. Thank you. Erica, thank you. I just discovered we have something else in common. I also grew up in Queens, <laughs> in Laurelton and then Forest Hills. Oh yeah, my and, grandma lived in Forest Hills and my dad grew up there. Okay, and my parents are also buried in the same cemetery. Oh, wow. That you discussed, Beth Israel Cemetery in Woodbridge, yes. Everywhere. In, I don't know what section they're in, but I know they're there. And my mother wanted to make sure that Holocaust survivor was scribed on her stone. So to make sure that people would not forget, you know, it, and it, it is a, I live here in Cincinnati and my husband and I have come to know a lot of other Holocaust survivors and people of an older generation. And we've had to, we visited them before their death and we spent time with them and, and honored them. And, and we heard them speak Yiddish and we heard them, you know, regale in, in, in stories of the Catskills and so forth. And so it's a lot of the things you alluded to or you describe in your poems are things that I know personally and other people I know here have learned about or have come to appreciate. Um, and so, um, very, I'm, it resonates for me a lot of what you have shared this afternoon with us um, in these poems. I'm hoping it also resonates for a number of our, our other participants here in our audience. Um, I don't want to just talk just from my perspective. I tend not to. I'm pulled into it because of how it is, I am so connected to what you described. Um, so Merle, did you have anything you wanted to say? Uh, I'll just say very moving and yes, uh, you know, I think anyone that grew up in the New York area, <laughs> we all can relate to um, a lot of what you talked about and the Catskills and the, uh, and the train and, um, and the idea that you can't find a good bagel anywhere outside New York, but yes. <laughs> So thank you and um, looking forward to the next. Thank yeah. you. And, and, and the one other thing I want to say, talk about the subway ride, when my children who are now 28 and 32, would I would take them back to New York periodically to spend time with their maternal grandparents. And we'd go on the subway from Forest Hills into Midtown and, um, or drive around the city and they were always taken by the cultural differences. I mean, you're trying to talk about your son. At some point, he is observing it. And at some points, he's not commenting upon it. It's, you know, and he has a very different home life, you know, view of what it means to be American. 
you know, a different view of America. And my 28 year old at the time said to me, mom, have we gone to another country? Because he looked around and he heard other languages and he saw the newspaper, the print media that people were reading and he recognized they were other languages. And, you know, he just, and then some of the street signs in Chinatown are not in English Latin letters. So just something very similar. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now we're going to go to Portland, Oregon for our next poet, Alicia Jo Rabins. She emphasizes that she is not just a writer, a musician, a performer, and a composer, but she is a teacher of Torah. And she completed graduate school at Jewish Logical Seminary in New York in 2007 at the Keck's Graduate School. So I think she's well aware of the legacy of Women's League and its connection to the seminary in New York. One thing I want to mention is as a composer and a writer and her teaching of Torah has led her to form a band she calls Girls in Trouble. And it's her way of um, writing her midrash about women in Torah. And she's written three, uh, two books that I wanna mention, Fruit Geode, which was a finalist for the Beru Award. The second book I wanna mention is The Divinity School, which was the first book, the first book, Okay, the APR Honickman First Book Prize. Hopefully I said that correctly, Alicia. So you could, Joe, so you could correct me on that. And her most recent project, which is finishing, has finished and has been in the fe film festival circuit is a cottage for Bernie Madoff. So Alicia, be my guest. Thank you. Can, can you all hear me? Great. Um, thank you for inviting me. It is such an honor to read with these two Amer two, uh, two Ericas <laughs> and this um, amazing Alicia. <laughs> um, I'm truly moved by all the words I've, I've heard. I'm so excited to hear Alicia. Um, so yeah, as Susan uh, mentioned, I do a lot of work with Jewish texts and traditions from a feminist perspective. I like to ask, you know, what would happen if women's stories were at the center of our tradition, if women's voices were at the center of our tradition, not only in women's spaces or modern spaces, but what if we look back at, at our ancient texts and um, center the, the voices and stories of women. And I also, I just love um, the traditions of Jewish texts. So sometimes um, I like to reinterpret stories and sometimes I just like to kind of write poems in forms that relate to to Jewish text. So I'm going to start by reading three short poems. I'll just show you in case you've done some text study, you can see that this this rectangular block <laughs> looks a little bit like you might see on a page of, of Talmud um, or, you know, maybe a little Mishnah. And um, I have a how to series that's woven through my book, uh, Divinity School, which is inspired by the Mishnah, right? But so by our instructional te texts um, from our heritage about how to live a good life. And sometimes they're very nitty gritty and sometimes they're a little more kind of ethical and, and broad. And um, in the tradition of writing how to poems, which is also outside of Jewish tradition, I, I wanted to make them a little bit uh, surreal. So this first one is called how to travel. But as you'll hear, it's really about um, internal travel. And so I, I feel like it resonates with our last year of experience that we've all had of of going on deep, complicated journeys without necessarily ever leaving uh, our, our homes. So how to travel. Sometimes you see the leaves as birds who have traveled all night and come to rest at dawn. Sometimes you feel the space between molecules of honey. Sometimes you are at the airport. Sometimes you are at the hospital. You find your seat an hour before sunrise and watch polar bears swim slowly underwater through the glass. Oh, immigration. Oh, fluorescent lights. The surgeon's rubber gloves brush tips of death against your cheek. This country stamps your passport and hands it back forever changed. 
Um, this next how-to poem is very short. It's 11 words long, so you can time your listening meters accordingly. And it's based on the um, tradition from the Torah that manna fell in the wilderness for the Israelites. So it's, it's a Passover-themed um, poem, since that was right after the Exodus. Um, but that only they were they could only gather enough for that day. And if they tried to save up for the next day, it would just sort of rot um, unless the next day was Shabbat. So um, I was really moved by that idea of uh, just taking as much as, as they needed. Um, so this is called How to Tell Time. Now, like manna, is perfectly sufficient and will rot if stored. A little Buddhist, a little Jewish. <laughs> And then uh, the last poem I'll read from here, the last how-to poem, is a Hasidic teaching, which I would like to say I did credit it at the back of the book. I'm not pretending to have made up this teaching. Um, what I, I just put it in my own words, and I added a title. So the title is How to Assess Your Net Worth. And you may recognize the content of the poem. How to Assess Your Net Worth. Take two small pieces of paper. On one, write, The world was created for me. On the other, I am only dust and ashes. Put one in each pocket, never leave the house without them. I see some people nodding, you recognize that beautiful text from our Hasidic tradition. Um, and then for the rest of my time, I'd like to share some new poems that I've been writing this year through the pandemic. And this was actually a cluster I wrote uh, almost a year ago uh, during Passover of looking at Passover through the lens of the pandemic. Um, I was just got a lot of um, peace and sort of a sense of well-being that was a little hard to come by, in, especially in those early days through um, processing my experiences through, through poetry. And um, I was sort of like, you know, homeschooling my kids all of a sudden who are six and eight and, um, and you know, doing Zoom concerts and just kind of getting through the day. And at the end of the day, um, I would take a bath, which is sort of my like safe space, <laughs> a very hot bath and, um, and write poems because I fortunately have a waterproof iPhone I could peck away at. Um, and I called them bathtub, po bathtub pandemic poems for that reason. So I'm gonna read a few from my bathtub pandemic poem series. Um, and this one is very much last year's Passover. They'll, they'll get closer to our reality now, but this is in those early weeks when we felt like uh, death was just right outside the door. This is called Passover 5780. As our ancestors painted their doorposts with lamb's blood, stayed inside and held their children close, we wash our hands, wipe down our shopping carts, and keep our kids off the playground for the first time in their lives. In this plague spring, when the leaders fail us, we try to keep each other alive. We are midwives of solitude and survival. When a baby is born, a mother touches the membrane between life and death and is forever changed as we are changed by this shadow which approaches closer every day. What is there to do but lift up what we love, chanting, pass over us, angel of death pass over us all, turn back into the myth you used to be before you became the news. I'm reading that, I can really feel how, how far we've come from there. And I'm like, so just grateful for all the vaccinations that are happening and the progress that we've made and for our scientists and for everyone who's stayed home to keep people safe. Um, this is called Reading Exodus in a Time of Plague. I used to study the holy texts night and day, certain there was some wisdom inside those words which would make me live fully for the first time. Now I immerse myself in the news with the same solemn devotion I once gave the rabbis. I have become acolyte of epidemiologists. I used to whisper evening prayers. Now I, write, now I recite statistics and watch the curves the angel of death draws in the air with his wing. Which color is the line for my city? Which for yours? Which of us is Pharaoh? Which Noah? When we leave this narrow place and walk out into the glaring desert beyond, will we recognize each other in that light? 
that one I wrote almost a year ago, but I'm feeling that now <laughs> as things begin a little bit to open up. Like, what is it? Um, I'll read two more poems. Um, Jewish holidays in a pandemic year. Remember on the first of Tishrei, as summer turned to fall, we stood together and sang all the ways we might die in this coming year, who by fire, who by water. Now spring unspools her daffodils and we sit down at Seder in the midst of a pandemic. I keep thinking about how we are not the first to carry out these rituals in unusual circumstances. We do what we can, smile through our screens, dip parsley in salt water, rec recline while drinking each cup, sing about having more than enough. We name the plagues, dotting our fingertips in wine, our joy incomplete because our enemies suffered. Such simple actions to tell these complicated stories. We suffered, but so did they. God is kind, but also cruel. Love will save us, but not from this virus. Sometimes the only way to leave Egypt is to stay home, if you are lucky enough to be able to. Dayenu, we sing. It is enough to ride the wheel of the seasons. In fall, we sing of a giant book with our names written in it. In spring, we part the sea once more and walk through together into the mystery ahead. And I will close with a more recent um, poem as uh, you know, hope begins to shine a little bit more. And I want to just thank everyone for being a beautiful audience. and. Um, these poems are, are posted freely on my website because I wanted to just share them. So if anything um, is something you want to visit again, um, you can find, find them there. This is called Light in a Pandemic. The mask feels at home on my face like a worn key in a front door's lock. I make cinnamon rolls without a recipe and it works like a miracle. We wipe the counters 20 times a day, pour the children glasses of milk over and over. When we open the refrigerator to grab the jug's thick plastic handle, a brightness inside stands sentry, holding us in its light for a moment. I used to imagine the refrigerator bulb stayed on all the time, like the everlasting light that hangs before the holy ark in every synagogue. But now that I'm older and have seen how everything can be lost in a moment, I understand two things. One, the refrigerator is dark when closed. And two, in every synagogue, someone changes that light bulb, some custodian or rabbi or teacher or congregant or volunteer. And though this sounds like the start of a light bulb joke, it is the opposite. In the face of all that would extinguish us, we pour milk, we bake, we take turns, wear masks, we keep the light burning, we keep each other alive. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I have taught hearing impaired people. <laughs> and I have a husband who's visually impaired. So I have a lot of empathy. He doesn't think I have empathy, but I tend to have a lot of empathy for people, you know, who have challenges. So, um, well, Alicia Joe. You, Alicia, you just, yeah, a lot of things. Um, I really, I don't know, I feel like how well you describe what you're experiencing or what you're noticing and these, um, whether it's stuff from the text, something from ritual from prayer and how you can still relate to it even though it's centuries old millennia old it's been practiced but yet it still resonates for you it still has a life it still has purpose and meaning and in the end the last light in the pandemic the idea of darkness and light and the fact that 
the light between us can be how we connect and support one another. I think that's what you were alluding to, that we can seek out the light, seek out the connection, seek out recognizing each other for who we really are and not being um, so limited in what happens um, and what, what we can gain from our life experience, you know, how we live. Thank you. Merle, any comments? I know, I just, I, I um, echo what you say. Each of these poets have been um, wonderful and it's, they all very moving. And um, it's lovely to hear, to listen to. I, I, it's a different experience, I think, to listen to you each read than to for me just to sit with a book. So um, I really appreciate that we've gotten a chance to hear everybody read and, and I look forward to the next Alicia. Okay. <laughs> Alicia Ostriker. Hopefully, Alicia, I'm saying your uh, name correctly. Um, I'm trying to see where her image is. We just need Alicia to unmute. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Alicia, have I pronounced your your name correctly? Oh, striker. Yes. And congratulations because not everybody does. Well, it helps when you speak multiple languages and you've lived in other places and traveled a bit. Um, so Alicia joins us from New York City. My understanding from trying to find out about you, Alicia, is you attended Brandeis and the University of Wisconsin at Madison. You are Professor Emerita from Rutgers University in New Jersey. You have 16 poetry collections that have been published. You have been recognized with the William Carlos Williams Award which for those people in New Jersey, maybe know that he lived in New Jersey as a physician, in addition to writing poetry on the side. And you received the honor in 2018 of being New York State's Poet Laureate. So Alicia, if you could share with us some of your writing. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I'll just say what everybody else said. It's an honor to be here with a group of Jewish women and with two Erica's and two Alicia's. That is so fun. And I'm, I admire my sister poets very much and have a keen sense of how different we are and how much overlap there is among us. Um, a lot has been said about immigration and exile. My grandparents all came over at the turn of the 20th century, which was just a few years after Emma Lazarus's poem, The New Colossus, won a contest that ultimately led to its being on the base of the Statue of Liberty and changing the meaning of that statue, which was originally given to America by France, um, basically as a gift to say we were both, we were both enlightenment countries, we had defeated our monarchies. But after that poem, in which the statue herself says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, which my grandparents were, they were poor. They stayed poor, but they were free. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I just wanna say um, a colleague of mine, uh, and I had a project last year that was part of my being the, the New York State uh, Poet Laureate, which I will end this year. Um, the project was to collect translations 
by poets whose mother tongues were from all over the world to collect translations of Emma Lazarus's poem. And we, we did that for the better part of a year. Those translations are now online at AJHS, the American Jewish Historical Society. Go find them. It is a beautiful site. Um, site in both sense, in both senses. It's online and every participant who translated the poem into their own language also said something about the meaning of immigration for them. Um, and we're in process of having them all record themselves reading their, reading their poems, reading in their language, oh, this, this poem of welcome to everyone from anywhere. And we did this at this particular time because as we know, the idea that we are a nation of exiles, a nation of immigrants is under threat. And we want to see it preserved, especially because that's what we are. Everyone here this afternoon is part of the nation of the nation of immigrants. So I want to start by by reading an opening poem uh, from this book, which is called The Book of Life. And it's Jewish inflected poems taken from six or seven different books um, over the years. And this is about immigration, the immigration of my grandparents' generation. It's about my Aunt Becky and Uncle Benny in Far Rockaway. The first people I knew who registered in my mind that way. Near the Atlantic Ocean, past the last subway station, streaks of sand on the sidewalk, armies of aging Jews soaking up sun as if it were Talmud, and the rickety white stairs to an apartment like a frail body. My uncle and aunt were both warty like alligators. They set a lunch on the oilcloth covered table. I felt peculiar about the smells. The lunch seemed to go on all afternoon, anxious syllables floating over my head like fireflies. Shana Madel was me. Eat, they said in English, eat. So I ate and finally reached the pastoral scene. Bo Peep, pink roses, green leaves at the dish bottom. One of those sweet, impossible memories Jews used to buy themselves in America. The two of them beamed, gold-toothed, as if their exile were canceled. You should eat and be healthy, they said. The next poem I'd like to read, um, I wrote af after attending an un unveiling in a New Jersey Jewish cemetery. And this is for Allen Ginsberg. Um, elegy for Allen. As you may know, he was buried alongside his entire family. All the, all the people he wrote about, his mother, his father, his Aunt Rose, and so on, his brother. Elegy for Alan. That was a break in the fiber of things sorrowful when Ginsburg died, because I still have students wanting to be beats, and even some wanting to be Buddhists, why not? But when that brilliant Jew poet took the train for the next world, 
American Nirvana temporarily went with him. Not that he ever attained the tranquility supposedly sought. He was so nervous and somehow ailing. The neurotic, utopian, prophetic, fairy side of the guy never surrendered really to those Asian things. And too much ginseng makes a man feeble like. Yes, B says, you would be there at a party and he'd say, excuse me, I have to follow that young man. You'd think, fine, but why are you obliged to announce it? Why not just say it? The greatest Jewish poet after Ceylon and Amichai, I cry, grieving, and B says, better not try to sell him as a rabbi, though what else is he? For heaven's sake, beads and bells and dreams of peace and all. Um, I thought, I thought Alan was the greatest Jewish poet of our time, except for Amichai and Ceylon. But um, now I'd like to, I'd like to read a poem about New York uh, from this book, Waiting for the Light, which got um, the Jewish Bush Book Council's prize in I think 2018. It has a whole set of poems about moving to New York after living for 50 years in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, we, we got an apartment on West End Avenue and West End Avenue and Riverside Drive uh, were settled by dominant Jewish families. A block away on Broadway in um, 97th and thereabouts, um, everybody speaks Spanish. And that was a little disconcerting until I realized when my grandparents came, when they were the new population, every, everybody spoke Yiddish. So this poem is called The Light and the book is called Waiting for the Light. What is the birthplace of the light that stabs me with joy? And what is the difference between avocados sold on the street by a young man conceived in Delhi and avocados sold in the West Side Market by cornrow girls? I am anyhow afloat in tides of Puerto Rican, Cuban, Mexican, West Indian, Spanish, wavelets of Urdu swelling like oceans, sweating like jackhammers, rasping like crows calling out in the West Side Market, the right aid and every other shop on the street. Por que no comprendes? You don't own this city anymore. The city belongs and has always belonged to its shoals of exiles, crashing ashore in foaming salty droplets. Como no, gringita? With their dances and their grandmothers, with their drinking and their violence and their burning yearning for dignity and smelling money. What, what is the joy? Is it those lamps of light, those babies in their strollers? Those avocados with their dark green pebbled rinds shining from inside? two for four dollars in the west side market and three for four dollars from the cart. Joy like white light between the dollar bills. Is it these volleys of light fired by ancestors who remember tenements, the sweatshops, the war, who supposed their children's children would be rich and free. So um, 
I do, I do a lot of work with Jewish, Jewish texts and Jewish tradition, um, but I am a third generation atheist socialist Jew. When I, when I say that to many audiences, when I introduce myself that way, third generation atheist socialist Jew, I scan the audience and I see some people nodding and smiling like you guys. And some people looking, what? <laughs> but as a feminist, I wrestle with the text. I wrestle with God. Um, and here is a wrestling poem from a book called The Volcano Sequence. Psalm. Uh, and this, this book has a number of Psalms, some of which, like this one, are anti-Psalms. I am not lyric anymore. I will not play the harp for your pleasure. I will not make a joyful noise to you, neither will I lament. For I know you drink lamentation too, like wine. So I dully repeat, you hurt me, I hate you. I pull my eyes away from the hills. I will not kill for you. I will never love you again, unless you ask me. And this is called During the Bombing of Kosovo. Um, and it, it uses the word Havel, which is usually translated as in most translations of Ecclesiastes, vanity. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Great line, very memorable, wrong translation. <laughs> because literally, uh, Havel in Hebrew um, means mist or vapor with um, with the meaning of, of imperna, impermanence, transience. It is also the name of the first man whose brother was not his keeper, Abel, whose brother was Cain. In Hebrew is Hevel. So this poem is during the bombing of Kosovo. Hevel may be translated vanity, or mist, or vapor, the name of the first man whose brother was not his keeper. It is evening, it is morning, one day, like mist from 10,000 feet above the hills, bombs fall like vapor. The thin air is full of them, roads crawl with tanks, soldiers like mist, tens of thousands of refugees cross the border, like vapor from morning to dusk, unmanned families, children in bare feet like vapor, carrying blankets, suitcases of clothes, like mist, money ripped off by border guards. Not new under the sun, not new on throbbing blue lit screen, but the eye tires of seeing, the ear, of hearing. Oh, we still prepare our feast of liberty and memory. We remain your children. And you, you, father of rain, what are you thinking? So that was written around the time of Passover 1999. Um, um, how's my time? We're here till when? What are we doing? Oh, well, so far we're a little over our time right now, okay. Alicia. So if all right, you, you've on. given us quite a bit to think about and quite a bit okay. to inspire us, I think. Merle, right. hopefully one, one you agree more. as well. I do. Um, do we want to ask for any questions from the chat for any of our four um, poets that would be that would be a good time to open yes. up the chat and 
if yeah, anyone has I, some questions. Yeah, I think um, we have we have 30, 30 participants at this point, yes, yeah, so. which yeah. includes us. So we have about 20 some people who could potentially ask a question. So if somebody wants to raise visually raise their hand or use the um, reactions tab at the bottom to put a yellow hand, um, we could then try our best to uh, recognize you. I know Merle will be looking, I will be looking, and Julia will be looking to see if uh, any of you have a comment or a question. Yes, so, so far we just we have a comment that says that this has been a very um, nice diverse group of poets and and I will say I it is it's interesting that um, everyone comes from a different background. There are a lot of overlaps. As Susan has said, I feel like I have uh, I could have personal conversations with everybody and and have a wonderful overlap and conversation um, and the poetry has been very different and and somewhat similar so it's it, it's been very interesting uh to listen to um and i and i'd like to encourage everybody on the call to um follow up follow the poets check their websites and and to buy their um collections of poetry to look for those and um continue to um and alicia joe is said, yes, we can share links. She put in her link, there we go. Um, so I think we would encourage everybody to follow them and to find their poetry and read them if they haven't. I'm hoping and, that we've encouraged people who um, do not usually read poetry maybe to run out and, and start reading poetry now. I, I think it's been very, a beautiful presentation today. Okay, so aside from Julia commenting that a list of all the works, poems would be shared with people, correct? And Erica Dreyfus put in the chat window, and I'll have to collect this later, that um, she found the URL for the translation of the New Colossus poems that Alicia Ostreicher and a colleague have been working on which um, kind of brings to um, the front of us right now, you know, how the immigration problem resonates even today, a hundred plus years later after the new Colossus was penned by um, Emma Lazarus, as well as used for part of the poem. I, I believe it's not the entire poem. It's only the last <laughs> half of the poem that's on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. No, it's the whole poem. The whole, the poem? whole, the whole poem is called The New Colossus. Yeah. But I think the part that most people remember is only the last. It's that's the most memorable part. But, yes. <laughs> but we, had, we had people translating the whole poem because it's partly important because it makes the claim that America is great not because it's triumphant, like the original Colossus, who is a warrior, but because our symbol is a mother. Very, very valid point in my opinion. I mean, I'm just <laughs> one person here. Anybody else have something to share, whether they're from Canada or somewhere in the United States? We'd really love to hear from some of you. I, I just wanna say that uh, I was so, I'm so deeply like kind of filled up right now from hearing all of you read your poetry and poetry is something I'm coming to now uh, and later in my life, I really have not been a reader too much of poetry, but always interested in it. And um, I teach yoga and I actually read a poem now before every yoga class that I teach. I have a book that a cousin of mine gave me called Woman Prayers from Women Around the World. Uh, it looks like this. I, mean, I don't know if you ever saw it, but 
it's just a re I mean, I've gotten so into it and now hearing you has just put me to a whole nother place. So thank you so much. Um, really inspiring. And one other thing I'm just going to say is being Jewish. It's amazing how all of you uh, having different um, backgrounds in Judaism yet um, I also, you know, I can just, and I don't have any family uh, from the Holocaust, but my grandparents were from Russia and Austria. And I also just, um, it's amazing how many things you said that resonate in my own life too. It's the connections, you know, and I have relatives in that cemetery in New Jersey because I'm in West Orange, New Jersey. Um, and just all of those things, it's, it's just great. You're all super talented. Thank you. Um, well, I'm uh, Barbara Smith, and uh, I live in Newport News, Virginia, and I've been with the uh, uh, Virginia Poetry Society. We came out with the Poets' Domain, uh, which is a group of poets from all over Virginia, and uh, also uh, I've written A Poetic Journey. A book that came out a while back, but I thought this reading was so significant. Uh, my poetry is broad. I've written some uh, poems on Judaica, but not totally by any means, but I thought this reading was so insightful and just remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Barbara Finkel. Pardon? Yeah. Oh, no, thank you very much. I was calling on the next. So I, I wanted to follow up on related to what Donna said. I am fairly new to poetry as well. One of the you know, things that's been opened up to me during the pandemic is a class of, I don't know if you all, some of you probably are familiar with Rachel Korazim. She's a Israeli just brilliant, um, teaches, I guess she's been teaching poetry for many, many years. I've just, you know, found out about, so I've been learning a lot of Israeli poetry, both, you know, the historical, the Zelda and Rachel and um, Amichai, and then she also teaches the modern, you know, current um, Israeli poets. And oh, I'm just so thrilled to learn about American um, poets who are writing just, magnificent work as well that that quite honestly I can relate to much more easily you know being on the F train or you know, so forth and so on so for me this was wonderful and I feel like a new world has been opened up so thank you thank you thank you yeah you're welcome Darcy hi first of all I want to thank all the poets today very inspiring and um like the other women who just spoke um I've also become interested in poetry since, really since the pandemic and I've actually started writing and um, had a couple of pieces published online. So my question to the poets is, what advice do you have for, um, uh, you know, someone interesting in getting po poetry published or just out there? I'll start if that's okay and say one thing you can do is subscribe to my newsletter because um, Every month I send uh, lots of current calls and competition uh, announcements out to people and between those issues I post things on my blog. So um, I have all of that and I also have specifically um, Jewish writing resources in a section of my website on Jewish writing. So I've tried to uh, offer those nib sort of nibbles of advice uh, throughout in various places and continuously. That's terrific. Thank you. That's all you need. <laughs> Can you share that on online, the, the newsletter? I think I think it will be in the documentation that I pull together that will share with the recording on the website. And I think it's also in the chat yeah. a stream. And um, Erica Meitner uh, echoed how Erica Dreyfus is newsletter is very, very uh, a, a wonderful resource. Okay. 
Thank you. So. The other book I'd recommend that's a pretty basic book that comes out um, newly every year is a book called Poets Market um, that's usually edited by Robert Lee Brewer that has just like a host of different um, publication resources and information. And it's especially great if you're just starting out because it has different levels of publications um, and it's pretty thorough and they usually have it at every library and bookstore. Um, and another thing you can do is look for poetry readings in your area and and look for open mics where you can read your own work and meet other people who are coming into the world of poetry the same way you are and you may want to take a poetry workshop there are poetry workshops everywhere in the country and it is a great way to um to to develop and to create community i have two things though in reference to that also i have an older sister in baltimore who has been writing poetry a long time and she literally goes to her calls Hadassah, she calls the synagogues, and she does poetry readings. She goes to nursing homes, and she just gets herself out. She's never been published, but she does get herself out. And then I have a grandson. He'll be 21, but when he was about 16, 17, he wrote a phenomenal poem. So it's called Gone, G-O-N-E, and it's by Cy Schimberg, if you ever want to look it up. It's a very interesting Actually, he worried his mother and I, we said, are you okay? And he is okay. He's just very bright and very deep. And um, he has a whole website on it. And um, because he also had then a, um, a uh, exhibition of other students um, interpreting his poem in different m modes of um, art and um, in, in Sarasota, where we're from. So, um, and he now wants to be either a stand-up comic or a screenwriter or something, but he's always writing and he's always doing. So you just gotta keep, we just let him go. That's it, <laughs> he does, so. That's great, thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> so okay. um, just before people start to leave, we can keep asking questions here, but I just wanna let everyone know um, that this will be, this recording will be um, processed, however they do that, and then it will be on the Women's League Reads uh, website, so people can uh, listen to it again and um, hear everything um, again afterwards or share it with friends. Um, and I just want to let everyone know that we have one more event coming up in um, May, May 23rd at 1 p.m., which is also a Sunday afternoon. Um, we're going to have a discussion um, what makes uh, what, how do we define Jewish literature um, and what makes, um, what are the traits that make something Jewish literature? Um, and we have three uh, panelists for that, Rachel Kamen, Wendy Marks from Long Island and Marcy Eskin um, from Illinois. And so um, I hope everybody will join us for that um, program also. And so um, we can continue to have a conversation here, though, if anyone else has uh, questions or comments. Um, I would just ask a question on, um, to our poets that when you um, are writing, and I think the poetry that I'm, I guess, from my youth most used to is the more short kind of uh, short sentences that sort of then the the reader needs to sort of interpret and that a lot of your poetry today seem to be more storytelling kind of poetry. How do you, um, you know, are there different genres for poetry that way? It, and do you pick a style or is it just whatever moves you in a, in a particular time you decide to write a different kind of poetry? Maybe I'll, Maybe I'll jump in because I actually have to go take care of my kids in a minute. So I'll, I'll say one thing and then I'll um, gratefully duck out. But, um, you know, I find that some poets have a, um, a style they like to write in and they stick with it. And some poets like to write in all kinds of different voices and styles, um, depending on, you know, the subject matter and the way they're feeling. And sometimes even the ones who are more consistent, it'll definitely develop and change over time. 
but um, it just seems to be a personality thing as far as I can tell. And then there are trends in the poetry world, certainly. So there are, you know, um, moments that it's more po popular to write in a certain way. And then there's always just so many poetry communities. So there are people who right now write stuff that can be posted and shared on Instagram. That's a whole world of poetry. And then there are people who write very long, very weird, ungainly poems, and that is also a whole deep community, you know. Um, so I will just say, personally, I'm someone who likes to work across forms. I, I like to be super, I feel like one of the great things about poetry is that it's free. Um, as someone who works in other media as well, you don't have to pay any actors, you don't have to rent rehearsal space. Um, and so I love the the freedom of being able to say, oh, for this, I'm going to try a, a haiku. And for this, I'm going to try a sonnet. And this one, I'm just going to do stream of consciousness for pages and see what happens. Um, and so especially if there are any writers here, I just really encourage that um, as like it's kind of a liberating form of experiment to say, oh, I usually do this. But today I'm going to try this other thing and um, not necessarily to make a great work of art, but to have fun with it and see where it, where it takes me. So that, that's what I would say. Thank you, Alicia. I just want to, I don't know if everyone heard what Alicia has just accomplished with her film, uh, uh, Kaddish for, for Bernie, Bernie Madoff. Madoff. Yes, so yes and so, someone mentioned they're from Sarasota and we aren't allowed to publicly announce this, but we just found out we got into the Sarasota Film Festival. So hopefully you'll be able to see it. And we will also be at the Ashland, Oregon Film Festival at the end of April, which is virtual and streaming from anywhere in the U.S. And for one more day today, if you're bored, we, it's 75 minute film and you can stream it for $9 until the end of today um, at the Portland International Film Festival. So if you just look up Akadish for Bernie Madoff, you'll, you'll find that. And it's a, it's, um, it's a kind of uh, meditation on what how to process the fact that someone from my community, broadly defined from our, you know, Jewish, from the Jewish community created the largest financial crime in history, um, but also how to look at that as a reflection of our larger American society and some of the challenges with capitalism and deregulation. So taking these big heady concepts, but also combining it with humor, some silly dancing, um, and it's based on a year that I worked on wall uh, that I had a, a residency in an artist space on Wall Street while that was all happening. So it's kind of all set there. So I would I would love for anyone who's has a stomach for a slightly um, experimental but also entertaining film to give it a what shot. Is the title? What, what is the title? The title is A Kaddish for Bernie Madoff. It's a little bit cheeky, but it's also quite serious and mystical. <laughs> Okay. And thank you all again for listening and for your beautiful spirits. And if you haven't tried poetry yet, maybe today's your day. It's so wonderful to hear of people who are just beginning to experiment with poetry. It's a gift to us as humans, to me, I feel, to be able to work in this medium. So come come join us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very all. much. I'm into that. Okay. Merle and everyone, I really want to thank everybody for, for poets. Alicia Ostreicher, Alicia Jo Rabins, Erica Dreyfus, and Erica Meitner for joining us today and sharing so many um, inspiring, perhaps provocative, thought-provoking words that they've pulled together. Merle, do you have any other comments to make as we end our, our program? Oh, the last thing I want to say is in preparation for the forum, the panel discussion on what makes literature Jewish or what is Jewish literature. I will be sending out some links to articles that uh, Rachel Kamen of Chicago brought to my attention. And I just discovered a 2012 book by uh, Ruth Wiss, W-I-S-S-E, who's uh, Professor Emerita from Yale, and her brother has been on faculty at JTS in New York, um, also a former New Yorker, um, or she probably still lives in New York, Yiddishist, Yiddishist has written about the Jewish canon. So I found that book, I'm going to borrow it and see if it has any relevance for us. So we, we, we've been inspired by Jewish poetry today. 
and hopefully we'll look into what makes literature Jewish. And really thank you for your very complimentary and appreciative words about this, what this has meant to you this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you to the thank poets you. for joining us. And thank you for thank everyone you. for coming thank to listen to us, us here. And thank you to Merle and Susan for bringing the program to all of us today. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.